Welcome back to CS111. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at how we can measure the performance of the algorithms that we implement and the code that we write. This is just going to be a bit of an introduction into the topic. If you're a CS student, you'll be taking a full course CS320 about this very topic. We're just going to touch on some basic concepts in this lecture. When you're going and coding solutions to a problem, a lot of times there's multiple ways that you can go and approach it. We've seen this so far with the array-based and node-based approaches to working with the bag abstract data type. With these different approaches, some of them are bound to be better than others. How can we go and compare different options to figure out what's going to be the best one to go and use? As an example, let's say that we're trying to go and calculate a summation where we add all the integers from 1 through n. There's a couple different ways that we could go and approach taking this math problem here and writing it in our code. And these different approaches have some different complexity. And that's what we're going to take a look at here. I've got three algorithms here on the screen. Algorithm A pretty closely models what the actual math looks like from the formula that we're given here. We're starting off with a variable to go and store our summation, and then we have a loop that runs from 1 up to including n, and we're just going to go through and add the value of our current loop counter, i, onto that summation each time. So that's algorithm A. Algorithm B is a more complicated version of A. With B, we have our loop that goes and runs from 1 to n. But inside, there's another loop. Rather than just going and adding i to the value of sum, we have this loop that goes and runs up to i times and it's going to go through and add one each time onto the summation. Algorithm C goes and does a little bit of math work for us here. Algorithm C goes and calculates n squared plus n over 2, which as it turns out is the shortcut for going and solving the summation. When we're going and trying to evaluate different ways of solving a problem, especially when we're trying to compare different ways, there's a couple different factors that we might want to consider. Some of these are going to be more human factors types issues, and these tend to be a little bit more subjective in how we might measure them. Others are going to be more computer science flavored, and these ones will have some pretty objective ways of going and measuring them. On the subjective side of things, one good place to start is to take a look at how we would go about implementing the problem and seeing if that resembles sort of how the problem is posed to us. You know, do we have a case here where we can kind of take the problem and easily convert it to pseudocode that we can go and implement? If so, you know, that's going to require less prep work and planning on our part. So that can go and speed up the implementation of the problem. Kind of related to that, we might want to consider how hard is it to actually go and implement the solution once we have it designed. Is it something that's pretty straightforward to code or is it something that's going to be complicated and going to be harder to code and then also something that's going to be more challenging for us to go and test and debug if there are problems. The other thing to keep in mind is how hard it's going to be for somebody to be able to understand your solution. We've all run into these cases when we're, you know, looking at sometimes our own code or other people's code where we, you know, we come back to it in the future and you just kind of sit there and scratch your head trying to figure out what exactly is happening. You know, I've run into where, you know, I have to sit down and get out a piece of paper and try to flowchart the design of, of what exactly is happening with that code's operation. That's not a good experience. Uh, it's hard for somebody to go and be able to wrap their mind around what's happening and it takes time and it can be kind of error prone. So if you have code that's going to be easier for somebody to be able to understand what's happening at a glance, uh, 
that's generally going to be preferable to something where somebody's got to really kind of think and, and try to work out what's happening. Even comments can be helpful there, but still, you know, well commented code is not quite the same as having code that is just immediately obvious what's going on. On the objective measure side, the first thing that we'll tend to look at is time complexity. This is basically a way of measuring how much work the processor is going to have to do as it executes the code. This serves as a rough proxy for the amount of time this code is going to take to run. There's more work to be done, it's going to take longer to run. We also have space complexity, which measures approximately how much memory the program is going to require to execute. Taking a look at the algorithms that we designed for solving the summation, let's try to think about those different factors. And I've got pros and cons written for each of the algorithms on the screen here. In terms of space complexity, that's sort of a pro for each of them. They all require a pretty small amount of memory to go and run. So that's not really something that really goes and benefits one algorithm too much over the others. They're all roughly the same here. So let's go and take a look at the other items. For algorithm A, which is our single loop approach, in a lot of ways that approach goes and mimics how the math equation goes and works. You know, in the math equation we were looking at, we had the summation, we were doing the 1 plus 2 plus da 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 up to n. And so for this loop, we're doing 1 plus 2 plus up to n. So the implementation is a pretty good representation of how the problem was posed. And for that reason, it's pretty easy to go and understand. On the negative side of things, algorithm A has some complexity to its implementation. It's not too bad, but it does have a loop. Uh, and that's a little bit more straightforward than if we just had uh, a regular line of code outside of a loop. So there is some complexity there. And that loop also does go and pose a little bit of a time complexity issue because that loop is going to go and execute n times. So we have to keep track of that. Uh, it does require somewhat more work. For algorithm B, we really don't have any other pros other than the fact that it requires little memory, which all of them share. Algorithm B is sort of difficult to understand. It's going to take you a moment to figure out especially what that inner loop is going and doing. We have nested loops which makes it more complicated to go and implement and those nested loops are also going to have a bit of an impact on our performance for this approach. Algorithm C is the simplest approach. It's just a single line of code. It's pretty easy to go and implement. We just have to make sure we have our parentheses right when we go and do our math. And it doesn't require any loops or repetition, so that's going to be good from a time complexity standpoint. Algorithm C, though, especially on the subjective side, has some negatives. It's complicated to understand. Unless you specifically knew what that formula was, it's not going to make any sense what exactly it's trying to do. It's not like algorithm A where it's very obvious looking at the code that it's trying to model a summation. And that's kind of, you know, sort of related. The other issue with algorithm C is it's hard to understand and it doesn't really resemble the math equation at all, at least the equation uh, in the expanded form that we saw. We can take the pros and cons that we identified and try to use those to kind of rank the different approaches. So what I've done here is for each of the algorithms, I've figured out which of, of the measures it was the best on, which ones it was the worst on, and then all three of them were the same on space complexity. So I, I just kind of listed those as being the same for each of them. Algorithm A is good on the human factors types of issues. It resembles the item that we're trying to model, our summation formula, and it's pretty easy to go and understand. It's not the worst on anything in terms of the uh, time complexity. It's not the worst there um, in terms of the actual implementation complexity. It's not the worst there. B is for both of those. 
So A's, you know, good on some things, you know, about the same on some other things, and it's not worst on anything. B isn't really good on anything. Uh, at best, it's a tie with the space complexity. And we said that B has the worst ease of implementation because of the nested loops, and the worst time complexity also because of the nested loops. C, since it's just a single line of code, and it doesn't involve any loops, it's easy to go and implement, and it performs the best with regards to time complexity. C doesn't do all that well on the human factors issues, though, because it doesn't really resolve, uh, resemble the item that we're trying to go and model. It doesn't really look like the summation problem, especially when you see the expanded form of it. And it's not really easy when you're looking at that formula to understand exactly what it's doing. Obviously, it's doing some math, but uh, in terms of what that math is supposed to be telling us, it's not immediately obvious. So we have some things here where A is good, some things where C is good. Um, which one is best? Well, kind of depends. So if we look at these approaches here, we can say that because it has the best time complexity, C is going to run the fastest. It doesn't have to go and do any loops. It just has to plug in some numbers and just do these calculations, and it does it all in one pass. Algorithm A, though, is a little bit more obvious in terms of what it's doing and what it's supposed to resemble. So it's kind of going to depend on the context in which you're going to go and use this code and how, to some extent, too, you know, what size of N are we dealing with here? Are we talking of an N that might be 10 or 100, or are we talking of an N that's going to be, you know, in the millions? If it's a small number, the performance difference from A to C is going to be pretty negligible. We're not really going to see any noticeable difference. But if we start getting up to big values of N, then that's going to be something more noticeable. So, you know, if we were going with work with small values of N, A might be better just because it's a little bit more obvious what's going on. Uh, if we're dealing with large numbers, then we might want to start thinking about the actual computational performance more, and that's where algorithm C really starts to shine. Those different measures that we looked at really do play in different roles. The subjective measures, you know, I said were kind of the human factors ones, those really are going to go and play into our ability to go and implement the solution here. So, you know, how close does our code go and resemble the problem as it's posed? How easy to go understand the solution? How easy to go and implement the solution? Those are all things that are going to come up pretty much at the time we're coding the solution or doing maintenance on it. The objective measures are going to go and measure how that code goes and performs when it's actually being executed. So these are kind of runtime measures, and these are going to be things that are going to impact our program more on an ongoing basis as opposed to subjective measures, which are pretty much just while we're going and coding it. So we've got these different measures. Which ones should we go and really try to look at and optimize for when we're going and picking a solution? In most cases, you do want to go and try to stay with the objective measures, the time complexity and the space complexity, because those are going to measure how your code actually executes when it's in use. You know, we want approaches that are going to run efficiently. We want ones that are going to run quickly and aren't going to take up a ton of memory. And that's what those ob sub, uh, objective measures go and measure for us. If you're dealing with a small project, though, like with the uh, example here with summation, if we were dealing with small numbers, then you know you might want to go and think more about the subjective measurements. You know, if we're dealing with values. Uh, in terms of how much data we're going to be processing where the value of n is small enough you know those performance differences in terms of time and space really aren't going to be all that significant so being able to understand the problem can be a little bit more beneficial and also being able to understand the problem better might go and save us development time. So if I can go and save an hour or two of development time and it's only going to take you know, a second for my program to go and run longer uh, 
that might be a worthwhile trade-off, especially if it's a program that only gets run once a month or something like that. You know, there is a trade-off for the development work that can sometimes be required to go and optimize the actual execution performance of our programs. If you've got cases where you have multiple approaches that have fairly similar time and space complexities, sometimes uh, the subjective measures then can really be useful as a tiebreaker. Just, you know, okay, I've got two of these that are going to perform fairly similarly um, in terms of when they're actually executing, which one's going to be easier for me to go and code up. That would be a good case to go and use the subjective measure trying to do as a tiebreaker. Let's dive a bit more into those objective measures and see how we can figure out the space and time complexity of our algorithms. When we're going and taking a look at the complexity of an algorithm, basically what we're doing is trying to approximate how many resources it's going to need. With time complexity, we're looking at processor power. Time complexity is essentially how many instructions the processor is going to have to execute in running your code. This is often related to, but not quite the same thing as how many lines of code you have. In your code, you know, you may have multiple instructions in the same line. You can also have cases where, you know, you have one function call or something in your code that when your code gets compiled, breaks apart into many different instructions that the processor actually has to go and run you're not necessarily going to be able to accurately calculate how many instructions your program is going to run but that's okay we're looking for a ballpark and for that sort of purpose working with just counting how many lines of your code that you have can be a reasonable proxy space complexity is basically how much memory our program is going to need out to have allocated to it for it to be able to run. Space complexity is something that used to be a lot more important in the past than it really is today. With earlier computers, you know, even up through the, depending on what sort of application we're looking at, um, sometimes even for desktops up through the 90s, space was pretty limited. You only had, you know, a couple hundred kilobytes of memory or maybe a couple megabytes. And that RAM, in addition to being fairly small in size, was also really expensive. So you wanted to make sure that you were as efficient as you could be with using that memory. Nowadays, we really don't have to be. You know, even your average run-of-the-mill laptop is going to have several gigabytes of memory nowadays. And memory is pretty cheap. You can go and buy a stick with a couple gigs for it's about 30 bucks. So since memory is pretty widely available and inexpensive nowadays, having to be really super efficient with it isn't normally that much of a problem. So for that reason, um, space complexity is something that isn't really looked at a whole lot in most cases nowadays. There's more of an emphasis on the time complexity side of things. Because even as processors have gotten faster, we can still go and compare the relative performance between different approaches. So everything might be faster, but some things are still going to be faster than others. Let's take a look at the time complexity of our different algorithms here. For this, I'm going to do a really simplified count. I'm basically just going to look at how many different math operations we're doing here. And even amongst that, we're going to simplify things. I'm not taking a look at going and, and working with any of the overhead associated with the loop or the original initialization of these variables. I'm just taking a look at, you know, how many times are we going through and updating the sum variable. If we take a look at algorithm A, we're looping for n times. So we have n additions. For algorithm B, overall, if we go and take a look at our two loops here, it's going to be n times n plus 1 over two additions. So that's how many operations we get is n squared plus n over two operations. For algorithm C, 
there's multiple operations, but they're all in the single line of code and they're just happening once. So we basically have an addition, we've got a multiplication and division. So essentially three operations here. This is a pretty wide range. Between these different approaches here, if we go and kind of graph them out, you can see that algorithm C requires what's called constant time. It's always going to require those three operations. The other approaches are going to have a variable number of operations required depending on the size of n. For A, it's going to grow linearly. So for every increase of 1 in n, we're going to have an increase of 1, roughly, uh, in the number of operations required. Things are going to grow a lot faster with algorithm B. Our curve is going to look sort of like a curve for n squared. So when we're going to go through and try to compare these different approaches here, uh, at least in terms of looking at the time complexity, we normally want to go with the one that's going to have our slowest growth rate, which in this case is going to be algorithm C because it's constant time. It doesn't really have any growth. For figuring the space complexity, what we're going to do is figure out what the peak memory usage is of our program here. So at any given point during the execution, what's the highest amount of memory that we may need to have allocated. And there's a couple things that we want to go and keep in mind as we go and take a look at this. If we have cases where we're going and creating variables that, for example, are limited to the scope of a loop, or like we go and call a function or method repeatedly inside of a loop, that variable, that memory, is going to have a limited lifetime. It's going to go through and just last for that one iteration of the loop, and then that exact same memory can be reallocated and reused for the next iteration of the loop. So, you know, if I go through and create a variable inside a loop, it doesn't matter how many times I run that loop, I only need enough memory to be able to create that variable once because I can just reuse it. Some other things to keep in mind here. Uh, if we're going to go through and pass items by reference, so this is essentially any sort of object, you know, we don't have to go and recreate that item each time. We're going and passing the address of where that item lives in memory. So we need a little bit of space for each of the time we're going through and passing it just to keep track of that memory location. But we don't need to go through and recreate the item. So if I have you know, a megabyte size string, I only need to have, say, 8 bytes for our 64-bit operating system to keep track of where it lives in memory. That's what I'm actually going through and passing. I'm not passing the full 1 megabyte every time. I'm just saying this is where it's at, where you can find it. The other thing with space complexity, and this is the issue where space complexity sometimes does become a concern, is if you have a recursive algorithm. So if you've got a method or a function that goes and calls itself repeatedly to go and break apart a problem. When you have a recursive algorithm, it's going to go and build up the call stack. It's going to go and keep all of those variables that are being created inside each call to the function live until they're all done. So if I have 10 levels deep and I'm going and creating, you know, let's say five megabytes worth of data at each level, I need to have 50 megabytes worth of space available to go and use for that data because it's going to go and keep each of those levels memory alive until it gets to the point where we stop breaking apart into smaller things and we start returning values. So recursive functions tend to have a lot of times higher memory usage than iterative loop based implementations. If we go and take a look at our algorithms here we can pretty easily figure out what their space requirements are just by looking at the variables that we have. 
all of these algorithms are pretty space efficient as far as things go. Some of them take up a little bit more than others, but really we don't need a whole lot of memory. We need to have space for keeping track of our sum, and I'm going to assume that we have a 4 byte integer. So I've got 4 bytes for that, we've got 4 bytes for n, and then on a and b I need some extra memory to keep track of my loop counter variables, but at most we're looking at 16 bytes worth of memory here. Now if I were to go and implement this differently, say a recursive solution, then my memory requirements would increase. But all of these really, the amount of memory that's required here isn't tied to the number of iterations or the size of our problem here. These are all basically constants in terms of the amount of memory that's going to be required. When we go and look at space and time complexity, we really don't care all that much about any constants that are involved in our formula. Uh, if we have anything that we're going and multiplying stuff by or going and adding, we really just can safely ignore those because they're not going to have a significant difference in the rate of growth that we're going to see from uh, the time or the space that's required from our algorithm as we go and grow the problem. It's really n to whatever power is highest that we're going to be most interested in. So if I go and take a look at algorithms a, b, and c from earlier here, a we always already said was just n, so n is really kind of the part that we're interested in here. For b, it's the n squared that I'm most interested in here. The, the slash 2 here where I'm going and doing the division, that doesn't really matter. The plus n, that's not going to have a whole lot of impact compared to the squared factor here. So this is really something where we're going to say the growth is kind of uh, on the order of n squared. For algorithm C, this is going to be what we're saying as a constant value here. So we're going to say that it's on the order of just one. It's not going to go and vary with the size n of our problem. It's always going to stay the same. In those cases, we're just going to go through and say that's a constant time or constant space. It's going to be just kind of on the order of one. Whether we're speaking about time or space, the growth rate that we're looking at from our algorithm really has a huge impact, especially as we start to get to larger values of n reflecting the size of our problem. So if I have constant time, I'm just looking at one unit or you know a, a this times or plus a constant multiplier for each of these different cases here, regardless of the size of my problem. Sometimes you'll see where problems will go and grow by a logarithm. And when we're looking at logarithmic rates here, in the computer science context, we're saying base 2. It's not like normal math where you might say base 10. In CS context, it's going to be base 2. Logarithms grow pretty slowly, a lot slower than just n, which is going to be our linear growth. Things can grow really quickly once you start getting into exponents here. So if we start squaring or we go through and start tripling things, our values are going to start growing pretty quickly. When we get into going and raising 2 to the nth power or factorial, our stuff can just completely balloon. And this really starts to matter. Because let's say that we have a problem and we just double the size of our problem here. If we go and start off with something that is, let's say here, n as the growth rate of our problem, we go and double the size of our problem, the number of operations that we have to go and do doubles. But when we get above n, the number of operations that we have to perform starts to increase a lot faster. So it can get to the point here where just going and doubling the size of our problem squares the amount of work that we have to do. When we get up into these sorts of rates here, our 
programs can really grind to a halt very quickly. We really want to try to avoid solutions, that especially our 2 to the nth power. Those ones just do not scale at all. And even some of these ones here where we're looking at anything more than about a factor of 2, we really want to try to avoid with our code here. To kind of give you a little bit of a comparison of how things are going to grow, let's say that we have a program that has a million items that we need to go and process and for the sake of argument here we'll say that it takes one operation to process each of them and we can do a million operations per second so if we have a growth rate of n our program can run in one second you know if we have something that grows slower than n if we have constant time or a logarithm it's going to take a fraction of a second if we're even up to say like n log n we're still dealing with numbers of seconds but beyond that the time required really starts to become a problem so if I'm just at n squared that problem that might would take a second if I had a solution that was on the order of n is now gonna take close to two weeks if my solution is on the order of n to the third I'm looking at thousands of years. It really matters the growth rate that we have for especially time complexity but also space complexity when we get in these big numbers here with our implementations. We need to be mindful of how efficient our code is. When we go and evaluate the time or space complexity of an algorithm we're generally looking at the worst case and we want to get an upper bound on how many operations could at most be required to go and execute this code or how much space at most might this algorithm need to have allocated in memory. Big O notation is what's used to go and represent this upper bound. With big O notation we're going to say that we have our algorithm which in this case here is going to be represented by this function f and we're going to say that it's on the order of big O of whatever our growth function is here. So we can say that it's got an upper bound of n squared. When we go and put the part inside of the big O here, the part inside the parentheses, we're going to omit any constants or anything that we're going and adding like we were talking about a couple slides ago those really aren't going to have a significant impact on our growth rate we're going to go through and really just focus on what's happening to n from a mathematical standpoint we say that a function or in our case here algorithm f is big O of another function g if there exists a real number c and a positive integer capital N such that f is less than or equal to c times g of n for all n values of n that are greater than capital N. Basically what this means is that there's some sort of constant here that allows g of n to go and serve as an upper bound. And this can really be a fairly loose upper bound as long as it's you know above the actual answer here in terms of what f of n takes it is an upper bound so I could have something that basically runs uh, in n squared time technically n to the third would be an upper bound for that not a great one but it still is so just as a reminder here um, the the big O of g of n represents our upper bound and we do want to go and omit any constants or minor variables you know where we're going through and doing like plus n um, when we go and write things in big O notation we're really just focused on the part that goes and drives the growth so for example when we were looking at algorithm B which we said was n squared plus n over 2 that one would be big O of n squared the n squared in our number of operations is what's really going and driving the time complexity for it.
where big O notation goes and represents the worst possible case for space or time complexity, there's also big omega notation, which is the best possible case. Big omega is going to represent the lower bound of complexity for our algorithm. Since it represents the best possible case, and that may not be a representative case, we tend to not really use big omega all that often. We're really more concerned with how our algorithm is going to work on an average situation, or at worst, rather than how it's going to do in the best case, which may be exceedingly rare. There's also big theta notation, where big theta of g of n represents a tight bound, so it's going to be both an upper and a lower bound. Basically, we're saying here is that if a function f is big theta of g, there's going to be some constant c and d that we can multiply g by that are going to serve as a lower and an upper bound to kind of box in the range of growth for function f. f is going to grow at the same overall rate of g, essentially. A lot of times what you'll see is that big theta notation will be used to represent the average performance for an algorithm. Although, technically speaking, you know the tight bound is not necessarily going to always be your average case. But you'll see it used with that notation a lot for that purpose. So if we have these different bounds with big omega, big theta, and big O, which one do we want to go and use when we're trying to evaluate the performance of an algorithm? Well, what you're going to see is that big omega, our lower bound, is not really all that helpful. It's pretty rare for us to go and see the best case, so we really don't want to go and optimize for that. Big theta is sometimes used, um, since it does go and give a, a tighter range, since it has both an upper and a lower bound, it's going to be the best measure in general for the performance we're going to see, but it can also be harder to calculate. For that reason, what you'll tend to see is that big O is used most often. It's, easy, it's pretty easy to go and calculate. We can figure out, you know, at most how many operations we're going to have or how much space are we're going to, we going to require. And we also kind of know that it is the upper bound, it's the worst situation we'll have to deal with. And that's helpful for when we're trying to go and allocate resources with processor power or memory for things. You know, we need to know how much we might have to make available. And big O being the worst case is going to go and tell us that number. So far this semester, we've looked at two different ways of implementing the bag data structure. We saw an approach that was based on a fixed size array, and we saw one that used nodes. What I've done here on this table is gone and worked out the big O, so upper bound, on the time complexity for each of the different methods in each of these implementations so that we can go and compare how well they perform. As you can see, they actually perform pretty similarly. Adding and removing items in both implementations is a constant time operation. This is because we always know in the array where to go to re add a specific item, and we can always go and remove a specific item because we basically know what the last space in use is. That's where we're going to add and remove. For our node based implementation, we're always adding and removing from the front. If we're trying to remove a specific item, it's big O of n because we have to go and search through n items to figure out which one we need to go and remove. Clearing requires us to go and do n calls to remove, so it's big O of n. Count is a constant time operation because we're going through and keeping this counter variable updated as we go and do our other work. So figuring out if we have anything left or what our current count is. These are both constant time operations. Finding out how many of a particular item we have is 
a big O of N because we have to look through N items. Figuring out if we have any of a particular item is also big O of N because we may have to go and look through N items. And converting our bag to an array requires us to go and copy over N values. So that's big O of N. So everything here between these two implementations essentially runs in the same time. And this is a pretty unusual situation. The fact that they both run in the same big O of time for each of these different methods basically means that our implementations are roughly as efficient as each other. Now, there's different advantages to them. You know, we know that the node-based implementation has some more flexibility um, in terms of not being tied to a fixed size, but at least with time complexity, they're both pretty comparable. Oftentimes, especially as we start to work with other types of data structures, is you'll see that different implementations are different with their times and that th the complexity of different methods may vary. So you might have some approaches that are going to be faster at doing insertion and you might have some approaches that will be faster, for example, at going through and calling contains depending on what type of data structure we're working with and how we're going and implementing it. When you get into that sort of case, there are some trade-offs. And one of the things that you're going to have to look at as a developer is figuring out what you're trying to do and what the likely balance is going to be between these different operations. You know, if we're going to go through and just store a lot of values and it's going to be pretty rare for us to go and try to retrieve any of them, or at least, you know, retrieve particular ones of them, then you know we probably want to go and choose an approach that has a fast insertion time over one that has a fast search time. But if we need to be able to locate items quickly, then maybe that fast search time is going to be more useful. Implementing solutions for problems in computer science is rarely a one-size-fits-all solution. There's different trade-offs that we've got to balance. And being able to understand the complexity of an algorithm, being able to take a look at it, the big O values for it, gives us one way that we can go and compare the different alternatives that are available to us to figure out which one makes the most sense. This lecture has an accompanying participation assessment in eCampus. There are three questions and you'll have 15 minutes to complete it. You need to work by yourself. You may go and use any of the course resources that I've provided with these slides, the lecture video, and sample code. You can also use your textbook and any notes that you've taken. You're not allowed to use the internet or anything else. That's where we're going to end things for this initial look at performance of different types of algorithms. We'll be revisiting this subject throughout the course of the rest of the semester, and you'll learn a lot more about it when you take CS320. If you have any questions, Please join the Q&A session or send me an email. Thanks and have a great day.